God wanted the dark from the second chapter of this gospel on, we have been getting very clear indications from Mark, who's writing, you know, what Peter's got for him, I think um, that's pretty clearly established. Peter, through Mark, is writing, saying, if you're going to work with this gospel, if you're going to be in this kingdom that Jesus has preached from chapter 115 on, then there are going to be implications for you. People are not going to like it. Those living in the kingdom of God can expect opposition for turning from sin to trust and follow the Christ who forgives sin in chapter 2. And that's where it all starts breaking out. Yeah? Jesus speaks to the guy who comes down through the roof on a bed yeah? and he says, your sins are forgiven. And the religious people go, boo, you can't say anything like that. Okay? And that's where it all starts coming in. So preaching this kingdom and proving this kingdom are going to make trouble for those who are part of that kingdom following this Jesus, and because they're following this Jesus, being fishers of men for him. Because that's the package. Sorry, I just, just, let me just run through the package again, because there are those who've missed it for the last few weeks, and it's important. Jesus comes in chapter 1 of Mark, and by verses 14 and 15, he's spelling out his manifesto, his agenda for the world. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Then he goes down the beach and he sees people and he shows them what's required of somebody who's turned from sin and trusted Jesus because the kingdom of God is at hand. He says, come follow me. Come follow me and in following me I will make you fishers of men. Bringing people into this kingdom, picking up on, on imagery of the net and the catching of fish and stuff from Jeremiah. Okay? Bringing people into the kingdom. And then he shows what that entails as he gets into chapter 2 because there's the guy through the roof and it's about the forgiveness of sins. I am God, I forgive sins. That's what Jesus is saying in chapter 2 with the guy through the roof. Don't often hear that in Sunday school. That's what's going on. Check it out. And from that point onwards, you're getting this opposition to the word. Jesus is showing who he is, showing he's the king, come to bring in the kingdom, come to reassert the authority of God over his creation. And, and, and chaos in creation ensues and the creation's chaos opposes the incoming kingdom of God. Is that making sense? You don't know how many thick books just got summed up then, okay? <laughs> but they did. They did. So then, beginning at chapter 313, in this second section now of Mark's Gospel, you get the appointing of the 12 apostles who are going to go out and do the fishing and lead the fishing. Lead the in-bringing of the kingdom of God through the proclamation of the message. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the Gospel. Opposition from people you wouldn't expect from family, religious leaders and family again. So the word of God is going out and you're getting opposition. What's that about? Surely the kingdom of God is coming in. Yeah. Jesus explains how that works by showing the power of the word in a fallen world, telling the parable of the sower. And the parable of the lamp, it, it doesn't mean, you know, you shouldn't put the word out there just because there's opposition to it. You put the lamp on the stand, that's why it's lit. And then it dries out the darkness. Don't back off. And then the seed growing secretly, you know. You sow the word and you, you don't know how it grows. You don't see it. You, you've just chucked some seed in the ground and it's gone. It's wasted. It's wet. It's cold. It's nasty. It's dark. And then there's a crop. The mustard seed. What happens is the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Did you pick this up last week? The significance of the birds of the air? It's the wild birds. It, it's, not your, it's not your pet budgie. It's not that domesticated parrot you've got in spite of his language. Where's he learned that? It's, it's the wild birds. They've got nowhere to shelter. And they come and find rest in the shade of the growing kingdom of God. Those people. No, don't preach last week's sermon. Okay. So, here we've got the outgoing, the kingdom of God's coming in. It's making progress through the preaching of the word. It meets a mixed response. Here's why. Here's how you're to carry on nonetheless. Because the Jesus who is preached is this Jesus. And, and Mark now moves on, chapter 4, verse 35, to show not just the power of the word, but the power of the Lord who is preached. This is the Jesus we're dealing with. We're not dealing with the theory. We're dealing with the good news of the kingdom of God. We're preaching Jesus to people. We're not preaching about Jesus. We're preaching Jesus to people. Making sense? Go all that. If I get a bit excited, it's going to go on too long, so don't, don't encourage that, okay? The stilling of the storm. Mark... 4, 35 to 41 is what we're looking at today. Yeah, you know all that. 
Okay. The scene, first of all, setting the scene. Here's the scene. Beautiful, isn't it? Do you remember? We went there once. Great, wasn't it? The Sea of Galilee. Little boats bobbing around on the lake. Fantastic. Jesus has been preaching. He's been teaching a large crowd from a small boat. And the reason he's been doing that is they're all lined up on the beach. And if he's down there on the beach with them, he's going to get mobbed, right? So he gets on the boat and he goes out a little bit and there's his pulpit. Boat stood offshore, give him room. And you can read about that in chapter 4, verse 1. Again, he began to teach by the lake. Such a large crowd gathered around him. He had to get into a boat, uh, back off, and get out on the lake and sat there while the whole crowd was on the shore by the lake. So he's out on the boat on the lake, sitting down to teach in the manner of what they're used to. You don't have to stand up to preach. In a Jewish context, they'd sit down to preach. Stand up to pray, sit down to preach. Let's not get too bound by their methodology because I wouldn't be able to walk around and you wouldn't enjoy it so much. But that's the way they did it, okay? There he is, sitting on the boat, preaching. Now the stuff about explaining privately to his disciples, the parables that he's been doing in the verses before these, that's just in brackets. So what's happening now with, with this bit, this stilling of the storm bit, is it's picked up from what he was actually doing, and the other bit was in brackets in between, all that parable stuff, yeah? So this actually goes straight on. Again, he came to, began to teach by the lake. Large crowd gathered in the boat. Okay, fine. But on that day, verse 35, when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go across to the other side of the lake. So after leaving the crowd, they took him along just as he was in the boat and other boats were with him. And it looks then what's happened is the evening has come and Jesus decided not to wade ashore and get mobbed by the large crowd, but to strike out to the eastern side of the lake. That's really important because the eastern side of the lake is pagan dominated. He's heading off into the Decapolis, where paganism and idolatry are the predominant belief systems, okay? So he's going over there. And as he heads off into that hostile territory, across the hostile sea, that sea makes its futile, chaotic, threatening attempt to dispose of the one who has good news, a light for the Gentiles. Creation is still in chaotic revolt against the sovereignty of the king. And other boats were there to eyewitness what happened. Here's the eyewitness account of what took place. A great windstorm. I love American translations of the scriptures. A windstorm. You know what a windstorm is? It just tells you what it is, doesn't it? A great windstorm developed and the waves were breaking into the boat. So the boat was nearly swamped. But he was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And they woke him up and they said to him, Teacher, don't you care we're about to die? Can you, I'd love to be in there. Wouldn't you like to see that? Don't you care, God? You know, we're going to die. Now we pray like that sometimes. And he's asleep on the cushion. It's not that he isn't active in the situation. It's not that he's not alert to it. It's just that we have such a vision of the threat and the danger and the difficulty and so little vision of the sovereign God who undertakes for all of this. And like them, we panic. So Mark paints this very vivid picture of the ferocity of the storm. You look at verse 37, you know. Grey windstorm, boat nearly swamped, breaking waves. Okay. So we've been there, and I can tell you that the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by mountains. Okay? It's like a basin. It's like an inland lake, a basin. And then violent winds come up from the southwest, and they come off the desert and whatever, and they enter that basin through the southern cleft in the hills. And all of a sudden, you've got to funnel into a basin. And they create a situation in which storm and calm can succeed one another really rapidly. The wind just veers around a little bit, and all of a sudden, it's blowing straight in. You see the point? And it's contained. Can you, can you see what? Am I flogging a dead horse? Have you got it? Do I move on? Yeah, move on. Shut up. It's obvious. Okay, fine. I'll move on, right? It gets fierce in there. And the disciples, Jesus in the boat, four experienced fishermen amongst them, are seeing this situation, seeing the storm at night, and they think they're going to die. Now, the reason for that may be that when this happens, it usually happens in, in, during the day because of the, the, the heat on the day and the hot air rising and you know, all that stuff going on, right? The way wind is generated in that sort of climate, uh, it's normally in the day. When it happens at night, apparently, it gets really very fierce. 
it doesn't normally happen at night. They'd go fishing at night because it would be calm on the lake. But when this does happen at night, it becomes a real serious issue. And that's what you've got. They're out in one of those on the lake at night, big squall. And those fishermen think there's a real possibility the boat's going to be swamped, it will sink, and they'll all drown in a storm at night. <coughs> Do you like boats? We've actually got one. This is the Genossa boat. Um, <coughs> sort of boat used, first century Galilean boat, unearthed in 1986, preserved in the Yigal Alon Centre at Genossa. There you are, now you know. Google it, it's there. It's 8.2 metres long, 2.35 metres wide, and if it is the sort of boat Jesus was using, a group of 13 would comfortably fill that boat. It is a low-sided boat, and it's a low-sided boat because they're fishing with nets, so you want to be able to bring it up into the boat. Broad-bottomed, low-sided boat, raised at the stern, so you can sort of have a platform where you can see all the fishing going on, see the fish in the water, that sort of deal. And for those who are not working at oars or working at sails or working at nets or whatever, cushion in the back, on the raised bit. Not surprising then that in this storm things are getting a bit sticky. Almost swamped was the boat, it says. And sleeping on the cushion in the back is the coming king over the kingdom of God. All three synoptic gospels emphasise the fact that he was asleep. It's a bit like Jonah, isn't it? You know, Jonah stands apart from the people in the storm that Jonah was in and got chucked into the water. Remember that bit? Sunday school, fantastic. So uh, he was asleep and it stands him apart from all the others who are panicking. And here's Jesus in the same sort of situation, stands him apart from all the others who are panicking, hardened sailors, because he's asleep, sleeping like a baby. In control of the situation, not out of control in the situation like the others who are helpless. And the disciples actually really speak quite rudely to Jesus in their panic. Jesus' deity is so veiled, so thoroughly veiled, as it often is in our everyday experience. You know, his identity is often veiled to us. We're not thinking about him as the king of the universe. It's so veiled from them and, and, and that the Son of God is just subjected to the rudeness of fearful, faithless, sinful men. Now, he's subjected to that. Don't be surprised if it, it comes upon you too. Their fear drives their manner of expression, and they're quite rude. Quite a shocking-sounding way they express themselves in, in, in the Greek. For all that they do understand, there's a lot yet that they don't understand, and that's why they speak out of order. It's very easy, isn't it? We can all do this, to think the person who's you know, not speaking to us quite the way we'd wish is, is doing it out of sheer pig-headedness. Well, actually, there's a lot they understand, there's a bit they don't understand. We've got to be alert to that possibility in situations like that. Now, of course, their blunt, don't you care if we drown, is the language of panic, not that of intentional disrespect. But what's clear is that for all they've learned from Jesus and for all they've seen, they haven't learned to trust the king over the kingdom during the wild storm and at night. And that's a big one. That's where faith lives. Trusting the king in the day is easy. Trusting the king while you're standing on the beach while he sits on the boat and preaches to you, easy. Much more difficult to trust the king over the kingdom in the wild storm and at night. And more than that, their fear seems to have lied to them a fair bit. You know, it does that. Fear does that. The way it does at the heart of the storm. They're persuaded the Lord doesn't even care if they die. Their fears are not justified. Good quote from Spurgeon on this. When you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. The man who knew what that was about. So how does the Saviour respond to this rude awakening that he gets in the back of the boat when he's having a good old kip? He got up. And he rebuked the wind. Have you ever seen that done? Have you ever seen that done? It's quite astonishing. Uh, you know, we're used to that because we know the story. Yeah, that is weird. What, hey? And wait till you see how he's doing it. It's interesting. And he said to the sea, be quiet, calm down. And then the wind stopped and it was dead calm. You try doing that to your wife, let alone to the storm. 
you'll be in deep trouble, won't you? Eh? Well, you know, the language is amazing, right? The language is just beyond belief. Don't, don't try that. Don't, I'm not recommending that. But you try saying calm down to anybody, let's put it like that. Whoa! Now he's doing that to the wind and the waves. It's astonishing language. But, but, but Mark is showing us a Jesus who is absolutely, calmly, in command of a perilous situation and in complete authority over it. The king always is, whatever it is. Lane, in his very balanced, measured, thick commentary on the Greek text of Mark, says this. He, and this is astonishing language for Lane, he is the personal living God who intervenes in the experience of men with a revelation of his power and his will. He is the God who acts, not some pale abstraction. <laughs> you know, and there in his, his, his Anglican measuredness and, and uh, English accent, it, it, it's Lane's take on it. He is the God who acts, not some pale abstraction. He is the one who can stand in the back of the boat and say to the storm, calm down! In the manner of that TV advert, what is it? Calm down, dear. What, what? Michael Winner. See, if you want somebody to name an actor, Caris. Michael Winner. Him. Acty person. Yeah, calm down. Whatever storms the Christian is facing, and we're called to serve God in a world where storms are part of the deal, we know the one whose voice commands the storm and makes it calm down. We know the one who commands the storm. Now, two surprising things jump out at most people out of this verse at the first reading. The trouble is, we haven't had a first reading. We've got a very accustomed reading, and that can be a complete danger. Firstly, Jesus appears to speak to the wind and waves in the sort of way you'd stop a dog from jumping up. Quiet! Get down! Be still! Right? Like that. Don't try it with cattle. Doesn't work with cattle. But you can do it with a dog. I had to say to the little bull this morning, hey, hey, come on, boy. Steady, boy. Steady. Different with the mutt. Get out, shut up. Secondly, the wind and the waves actually obey him when he does. They obey him when he does. Astonishing enough for the wind to immediately hold its breath, but the waves also disappear at once instead of their energy gradually decaying in line with the established laws of motion known to modern physics. You know, you'd expect them to sort of subside gently, quietly. The energy goes away. No, it doesn't say that. It says immediately. The wind stopped, the waves were still. How'd you do that? I mean, okay, experiment. Next time you get in the bath, right? Try this, right? You jump in the bath and you make a splash. Well, some of us, you know, people of stature. We jump in the bath, we make a splash. Try stopping the waves from moving. Try it. It's only a bath. He can do that on the Sea of Galilee, which is quite large, isn't it? That's who we know. But see, that's the way we normally look at it, and there's far more to what's going on than that. We, we normally look at it as a physical process because we're bounded by our physical parameters all the time. <clears throat> the wonder of this miracle is not that it is a tremendous physical miracle. The emphasis is really not on the physical, but on the metaphysical significance of what's going on here. What do I mean? These four miracle accounts from here to chapter 5 verse 43 are about Jesus vanquishing and subduing forces in the creation that are hostile to God. Forces that have come into creation because of the fall and are hostile to God. And the kingdom of God has been coming in since chapter 115 where it was announced and it's begun to be inaugurated before our very eyes in these opening chapters and these four miracles that follow the four parables in the chapter show Jesus conquering features of creation that are held to be in cosmic rebellion against God. Jesus is encountering chaotic forces that Satan deploys and that's emphasized in this first miracle in the series. He's dealing with the sea. The word that's used is for the sea. And from Genesis 1 onwards, the Hebrew term to home, the deep, 
refers to the watery deep, the salty ocean, the primeval ocean that surrounds and underlies the earth in Genesis, the deep, the depths, the deep places, the abyss, the deep sea, the, the, the primeval ocean, the abyss, the grave, the watery deep. Now those are all ways that it's translated in translations you have come across. In the Bab Babylonian account of creation, so this is going around in the ancient Near East, it's an ancient Near Eastern idea, not just a Jewish one or an Israeli or whatever from the start, an Old Testament one. There's this, in their, in their uh, Babylonian account of creation, there's this god, pagan god, you know what I mean, called Marduk. And he killed the goddess Tiamat, the salty sea, and he used her carcass to create heaven and earth. Now that's pagan mythology, right? But it's chaos being subdued to create. The sea is associated with chaos and destruction from, from the beginning of ancient Near Eastern civilization. And God created the sea back in Genesis only for it to come to symbolize chaotic opposition to God at the fall. And when in Mark chapter 1 following, Jesus is restoring his authority, he brings the forces of satanic chaos back under the control of his incoming kingdom by bringing it in again under the authority of his word of command. This is not just a physical, but a metaphysical miracle when Jesus stills the sea and commands it to be calm, do you see? In Old Testament thought, the surging of the sea represents chaos in creation. And Jesus, bringing in the kingdom of God, goes, shut up, get down. And the word of the king restores chaos in his rebellious creation. Is that making sense? Now he's going to go on and deal with, you know, demonic stuff and sickness and death and all that stuff in the next few miracles. But right at the outset, it is the surging sea, chaos, the forces of the abyss that he deals with in the storm on the lake. Jesus brings the surging sea, the motif from the Old Testament of chaotic satanic rebellion against God's ordering of creation, back under his authority, back under his control again, which shows that his kingdom is now coming in. Do you get that? It's a big deal, isn't it? Jesus overcoming the effects of the unleashing of the forces of chaos at the fall, that theme runs through this and the subsequent three miracle accounts. You wouldn't get this from the English translation, but the word that's used here is the unusual word of command that Jesus uses to stop the surging of the sea. It's the word that he uses in chapter 125 to stop the surging of the demonic forces that have overtaken the man he encounters in the, Canaan, uh, the synagogue of Cana in Galilee, who's demonized. So he uses the same word to stop the demons gallop as he does to stop the surging of the sea, because the two things are together. Do you see what I mean? Is that making sense? Jesus rebuked him. Silence came out of him. Jesus rebuked the sea. Silence be still. So he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, be quiet, calm down. And the chaos of cosmic rebellion bows to his sovereign sway. Then the wind stopped and it was dead calm. And there's an aorist tense. It indicates an immediate result. It happened straight away. And the report of that immediately calm sea just emphasises the total transformation Jesus' intervention brings about. There you go. The Lord spoke and it was calm. There you go. Great then. Simple. It's a nice story. Very reassuring. Everybody happy? <laughs> you know there's a sting in the tail. Don't you? <laughs> you know when, when I say something like that halfway down, you know, well, more than halfway down, you know there's something else coming. Well there is. Because Jesus follows up in verse 40 with the first of a series of rebukes. Here's the Saviour's challenge. He said to them, why are you cowardly? Do you still not have faith? Time is ticking away. Question mark. Do you still not have faith? Time is going. You see, in the light of the challenges that we encounter in a lost, fallen world, hostile to God, faith is required as well as repentance. Way back there in chapter 1, verse 15, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God is coming in. That has implications for how you, how you live your life and how you encounter the challenges of your life in a fallen world, day on day. So Jesus turns back to them and he says, look, here's the threat to it all. Am I not sovereign God? Am I not in control? 
Do you still have no faith? Faith is required as well as repentance and that faith works out as trusting Christ, the coming King, even when the storms rage round us and the skies are deeply dark. And he's asking them to repent of their cowardice. The coward is born as, as the opposite of faith. Because courage is born of faith. I'm not here standing here saying, be courageous. Right? I'm saying here, take your weakness and place it in the hand of the God who is reliable and trustworthy and trust him. <coughs> Here's the Saviour's point. Here's the author's point as he writes this down. Here's Peter's point as he applies the teaching of Jesus at this point. Here's what's being said to those Christians in the church in Rome, under threat. Now, you know, I, I know we're all facing all sorts of things. We've got all sorts of things to disturb our peace today. Guys, we've got nothing to complain of compared to those guys who are Christians in Rome at the heart of the evil empire during the reign of Nero. Okay, that's what we're dealing with. We have nothing of which to complain against those guys. But even yet... Jesus, through Peter and Mark, is saying to those guys, who is this? Because we're told straight away, those, those guys uh, standing around, that their big question, who's this? They were overwhelmed by fear. Now hang on, the storm just stopped. The storm just stopped. And because the storm just stopped, now... They are overwhelmed by fear. Is that making sense? You don't get that here. Doesn't make any sense, does it? Well, it does make sense. They were afraid when Jesus stopped the storm. See, the awesome power of the coming king over the kingdom of God, who speaks the word and the storm subsides, that awesome power is more fearful than the terror of a sinking in a ferocious storm at sea by night. Yes, it is. The authority of the king is such... It is an awesome power and authority. And it says, in the Greek it says, and they feared with a great fear. They feared with a mighty fear. They were a feared with a mighty fear. It's a passive. Okay, there you go. So now we've got it right. They were a feared with a mighty fear. Not because of the storm, but because of the sheer authority of the one who was amongst them, who can speak and still the storm. The big question, the big fearful question is this who is he standing there who is he who has such awesome authority as this so here's the bottom line for us standing round kingdom of God is coming in but when it's preached the response of a fallen world to that message is mixed and to the people who preach it is even more mixed still but you keep on preaching the good news of the kingdom that's the message of the parables we looked at in the last few weeks the kingdom of God is coming in but there is still an awful lot of chaos in the cosmos and yet when he's encountered in that chaos Jesus acts like he's king over his kingdom and the chaos is progressively pushed back as his kingly authority presses in as he speaks the word And the point, the whole point of being told this lovely story, children, about the boat on the lake and the storm at night, and all that, the point of it is this. Who is he? With whom we have to do. Who is he to you? There are plenty, plenty of storms that you and I will encounter as we seek to follow God and live in his kingdom. Plenty storms. Who is he to you in that storm? And what are you to him? Isn't it amazing how the nice little stories from Sunday school are actually Powerful, mind-blowing stuff. God wanted the dark and light.